little bit about my passion for this BPD documentary, Borderline Personality Disorder. I have a strong urge to educate our society about what BPD is. It seems that a lot of people know about bipolar, schizophrenia, and BPD is so much more common. This is a complex set of symptoms that happen from the environment, it happens from um, temperament, it happens from trauma. A lot of the individuals have had um, sexual and physical abuse, so I really hope this documentary reaches those individuals and the loved ones so that they can get help, so they don't have to suffer anymore. I suspected it for quite some time, just based on a lot of the things that I was experiencing in my life. A little precious. Or, and then, and then, it's joke, jokingly, a little pressure sometimes. <laughs> when I was about 19, I was in a psychiatric hospitalization for just a myriad of things that were going on at the time and just not feeling safe. And on my discharge paperwork, they had written rule out borderline personality disorder, but I never followed up. So it kind of got lost in the shuffle. Um, but it wasn't until about three years ago that I officially received the diagnosis during an intensive outpatient treatment. My whole life I would just hear, oh, you're too sensitive or you're crazy or you need to get over it. I would hear that a lot. You need to get over it or it's no big deal, and it is a mental illness, but it's something that that can be treated, yeah. yeah. It's very difficult having to move back home, you know, what, four, five years ago? Five years ago, four and a half. Because uh, it was, there was a lot of shame and a lot of guilt, and uh, I mean, those are two things that I just uh, have a really hard problem with in, with everything. My first diagnosis was, you know, I tell people this, was actually by a noted investment banker in 1985. <laughs> he said, Teresa, you know, I, I love you, I'm not trying to criticize you here, but you know, you're kind of a walking nerve ending, and um, I feel like I could rip your life apart with one sentence. And I, and I kind of, I took that as character flaw, you know, because I didn't know. I knew by my background there had to be some problems. So I, I went to varying psychologists, psychiatrists, I was told, you know, post-traumatic stress, complex post-traumatic stress. And if you look at those symptoms or the, you know, they're all kind of similar. So right. to I me, it's not, an, it's not an exact science. Um, a lot of it revolved around relationships, just really intense relationships, trust issues, lots of fears around abandonment and being left and not being able to tolerate and handle those fears even when they weren't always realistic. They mm -hmm. felt really real to me, yeah. you know, and I had no way of knowing at the time how to decipher that. It just, it felt real, so it was real, and I reacted as, as if it was real. Threatening that I would um, hurt myself in some way because I felt so desperate um, for whoever it was not to leave me and I didn't know any other way and I found that that worked to really like grab someone's attention and, and make them care and not want to leave. I remember saying to the psychiatrist over and over again, I don't know who I am and I'm freaking out and I, and I can you help me? Is there something that I can do to figure out who I am and to, mm. to heal this part of me. It was scary because I noticed that I was very chameleon-like and I would, whoever I was around, like I, back in the, at that time, if I was in that place, I would be looking at you right now and your mannerisms and, and, and mimicking that back and mm. trying to be like you. You know, so I never really had a sense of who I was apart from anyone. And the thought that occurred to me before I really had the breakdown where I ended up in the intensive outpatient and got my diagnosis was 
I was um, really distressed about something that happened at work and I was thinking about how I had behaved that day versus um, how I behaved with other people in a different setting. And I, I thought, what would happen if I were in a room with all of these different people from my life at the same time? Like my boyfriend, my sister, my therapist, people from school, people from work. I, I just froze and freaked out because I realized I was so different with each of them in each of those settings. I had no idea how I would live or how I would be. I had no sense of self. And um, that's ultimately what led to my diagnosis. I think I was first diagnosed as borderline when um, early 20s. Mm -hmm. Lots of cutting. I started cutting impulsivity and just being kind of reckless. And lots of suicidal ideation. I was basically paralyzed for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Just in bed, you know, not taking care of myself, not bathing, you know, just lying in bed for a couple of years. And um, they were so patient with me. <laughs> Over the decades, I just tried to manage and cope, um, and I think too general, uh, generationally, you know, being born in 1960 and in the South and having to have a certain behavior and manners, you know, you just held it all tight because you wanted to be mannered and, and, and appear a certain way, and so it was my uh, second marriage where things really blew sky high because of the type of person I was with, and he... He left a copy of Walking on Eggshells out on the kitchen oh, counter. You know, we all walked out. Uh, and of course, opening and reading, and uh, that was kind of tough. So that kind of introduced me to the concept of it. A lot of um, women who have poor life personality disorder, their most difficulty is in relationships, and men do not stay, largely for better or for worse, and I said those words and, and I meant them, you know, that's, that's not easy, but we find ways to deal with it. I learned a lot in the last 12 years, but uh, it's worked. My long-term boyfriend of almost 13 years would often travel back home to Europe to visit his family, and when he would go, at least in the early years, especially before my diagnosis, I would have severe mental breakdowns. Um, almost always end up in the emergency room because I would get so sick that I'd become dehydrated because I, from the nerves, you know, and um, I would end up in the emergency room and, and they would always um, end up saying, yes, you are dehydrated, you got yourself really sick, but this is anxiety, this is stress, we're going to put you in an intensive outpatient program. Um, and it, it was all that feeling of emptiness when he would go away because suddenly I'm at home with my two cats mm -hmm. and I have no idea who I am and I'm terrified and, I, and it was just if anyone had been around I think I would have felt safer just to have another human being around but without anyone there I just felt empty and um, at least if I didn't exist it was just such a weird feeling. There's one incident that I share with you mm -hmm. when we were getting to know each other a little bit. Um, I was about eight years old and um, I was with my dad and his friend and I started feeling really sleepy and kind of sick. We were like out at a restaurant and I knew that my, my dad's friend wanted him to like go with him to the horse track or something but my dad didn't want to go because he didn't want to drag me there. So I don't want to make up something that didn't happen, but I, when I think back at how sick I felt and how quickly I became drowsy, I, it's possible I was drugged. Um, when I woke up, I don't know how I got there, I was in a strange place with somebody that I didn't know. I got very sick, I was sick to my stomach, throwing up, I was there for about a good three days. And um, yeah. when my father finally came, uh, to pick me up, I was severely dehydrated. And I just remember him saying, if you don't drink this, you're gonna die. And it was like some kind of like water with Alka-Seltzer, like some kind of concoction he had created because he saw that I was really dehydrated. And he kept using those words, like if you don't drink this, you're gonna die. If you don't go to the hospital, you're gonna die. Yeah. And I remember being so terrified, you know, and um, 
not understanding what was happening. And it's obvious to me that that was one of the major, major um, things that has happened in my past that would have led to developing um, BPD. Yeah. And it's just one of many stories. So. Chris always did well in school. Her teachers always liked her. Um, she sometimes didn't like her teachers, but felt that they preferred other kids or whatever. And early, early on, she was an amazing gymnast. I mean, she really got into it as like a six, seven year old. And then when she was about seven, you had an accident. You, it was during practice and you fell on your, on your back. You got really scared. And, um, and that was kind of the end of gymnastics. Then you kind of quit. And, um, and there was no going back. That was it. It was done. And, um, and that sort of started what seemed to, to Jim and me, and maybe to you too, to be kind of a, a pattern of starting things, doing really well, being so talented, so able to do things, and then hitting a snag, and then that's the end of that. Well, I think a lot of it's a wiring thing. My mother's mother was bipolar and like in the hospital, basically my mom's whole childhood and adolescence. A lot of sexual abuse, chronic sexual abuse, stepfather abandonment, father, stepfather. My mother, you know, she, like, she did the best she could, but she was pretty self-centered and so there, it was just, you know, moving to the next husband, moving to the next house. There was never any addressing, even when it was, uh, my stepfather was caught after three or four years red-handed when I was 10 years old. And it was just, okay, apologize, and that kept happening. And then she divorced him, but there was never, like, we gotta really use some help. There was never protection. Yeah. There was, there was a, you know, we're from the old South, born in, she was born in 1940, South Carolina, and you yeah. just didn't talk about things like that. Right. You're just moving on. Yeah. And, you know, as a teenager, it, it really started, Bubbling. Yeah, and so a lot, you know, what people would call daddy issues, you know, yeah. needing and wanting to be loved by boys, and I wasn't very sexually promiscuous just because of my upbringing, you know, that, but it's I was very needy getting the attention, and uh, it gets even harder because I was a pretty girl, you yeah. know, and you get a lot of the wrong attention. <laughs> I've always just been really, really emotional, and I think maybe birth order and that I have two um, much older brothers who were only two years apart and so my mom has always said that she felt like I was almost an only child. You'll compare and despair constantly. I don't have a college degree, my life's been such a mess, my family doesn't care about me. It's just constant negative, constant, except for in moments where you're, when you're having fun and you think, well if I'm in the best shape, if I have this job, if I make this much money, and if I, you know, if I appear to be okay, I'm going to be okay. And what you don't realize, it's an inside job. It's just an inside job. And so you go decades of your life that way. And also, one of the big things I dealt with was dissociation. That was huge, because I, I lived with a chronic trauma as a child, so I developed mentally you know, got rewired. <laughs> I call them episodes. She has little episodes, and you never know what episode you're coming home to. Um, <laughs> sometimes they're different, you know. Uh, I, I used to get, sorry, I used to get, ups <laughs> I used to get upset about them, and, and, and we would fight like cats and dogs because I didn't, I didn't understand, she didn't understand, and we, didn't, we just didn't get it. It just, I thought that this was her personality, and it wasn't a mental disorder. We had no clue. I was afraid I was gonna walk home to the one that was really pissed off at me. <laughs> And, and uh, more than half the time I would, and I just, I just wanted to keep my mouth shut. You know? I said to you before, it, it takes about 10 minutes for her episode to start and finish, and if I keep my mouth shut for 10 minutes, it's over. And, and everything is back to halfway normal where we can deal with it on a conversation level. Since I'm outgoing and gregarious and stuff, and I can it's speak easy to, to people, it's, it's so easy. Uh, and, but if I would have a fight with my husband, and it would get really intense. It, you're, you're, the desperation, 
the fear is so intense, the shame, everything is just so, so intense. I remember going into my closet and being screamed at and running into my closet, slamming the door and just literally pulling every bit of clothing I had on top of me and staying yeah. underneath it until I saw myself. And then when we started learning more and more about uh, the, the, the disorder, um, I did some research about it. I just, you know, the internet's a great thing. Yeah. And uh, I just learned what the different, the different uh, characteristics of, of what she does and why she does them. And it, it didn't hit me that I didn't have, as she said, empathy for it until we were in an argument at one point in time and she looked at me and she was crying and she said, do you think I really want to be this way? That's when it hit me. I go, you know, no, I, I'm sure you don't. And that that's when it's like, okay, I, I just can't be in a long line of people that just walked away when it got hard. You know, I, I, I care about her too much and uh, you know, well, why be just another person that, that takes off and when, when it's hard? I was unfortunately in a situation in a marriage that was highly invalidating. And even though some people can learn what to do, but they don't possess the compassion or empathy. Mm -hmm. It's just not there. Not there. It's not. Doesn't make them a bad person. It just they're not the type of person that's gonna, you know, help you through a tough situation. Mm -hmm. Get it together. Your BPD is an excuse, you bruise like a grave, I can't take it, you know, that kind of thing. And there's constant shaming that makes it very hard to recover. And that's why I'm so passionate about working with families. Yeah. They make all the difference. Right. All the difference. I was doing heroin and um, wasn't drinking, but I spent a whole mm. lot of money and mm. I, think I, I think I cut myself. Mm. And um, uh, just we like reconnected with the people that I really shouldn't have been around. Just a couple months before I moved in here, I actually had a suicide attempt and was 5150. You know, I just felt like when I would talk, I didn't feel like mm -hmm. my words made sense and. The, yeah, I mean, the only words that really feel right is just bankrupt and yeah. just hollow, you know, just more than empty, just, I have a tattoo right in my arm right here that says hollow upon hollow that I actually got like a year ago and I just feel like I've burned so many bridges so I am so scared to... Mm for that to happen again. I mean, I could I could write books <laughs> on the shit right. I've done. So once I received my diagnosis and I found out that there was something, a treatment available called Dialectical Behavior Therapy or DVT, I was so excited, you mm -hmm. know, and I signed up for it right away at the clinic. And I'll be honest, like initially I didn't think anything could really help me with the severe symptoms that I experienced to the point where I would notice like a huge difference in my life. But I was so desperate and had used CBT for other things in my life that and, and had success with that, that I said, okay, I'm gonna give it a try. I'm just gonna like stick with it for at least a few months and no matter if it feels like it's working or not and mm -hmm. just keep going and keep practicing and doing everything they say because I wanna see if this works, right. you know? Um, and I did start to see changes in my life. Thank God for DBT, mindfulness and compassion, those things. What a difference because you just can't do this cognitively when your brain is in full, you know, amygdala loop. You can't access your your prefrontal cortex. It's just not there. So that's why we have to learn to just go into our bodies and get ourselves calm. That's why I tell people the first job is to is to get yourself to a normal baseline so that you can think creatively. But that's what we do, we make things worse because we're trying to make this, stop this now, stop this now, make this, I gotta make this stop it's right like now. Accepting, so we right? make a yeah. lot of bad choices. Yeah, yeah I get yeah. the words. Yeah. I mean, at one point I was on like seven or eight medications. Now I'm just down to four. I take um, Zoloft, a mood, mm -hmm. I mean a depressant, mm -hmm. antidepressant. Um, Topamax, a mood stabilizer. 
uh, Lamectol, which is also a mood stabilizer, mm -hmm. and Trazodone to help me sleep in my well, I didn't take all the drugs at all. I had the side effects would just drove me crazy. And I'm a naturalist anyway, I'm a homeopathic yeah. kind of person. Mm -hmm. You know, I won't even take a Tylenol. So <laughs> that was kind of tough on me. I've been on a very low level of an antidepressant mm -hmm. and a very low level of an anti-anxiety medication that I take before bedtime. Mm -hmm. um, so that's basically it, you know. I was on Zoloft for a long time. Because if you're mixing around medications, that throws off the whole balance. And that's what's, I think, happened to me yeah. for a long time. Not seeing a therapist you know, very often, you never develop that close relationship and they never become familiar enough with the people that you talk about in your life and so you never feel like you're really getting anywhere. With Borderline, with what I'm able to see this now, uh, we, can, we can be a little manipulative. We could say to therapists what we want to say. Painting your own picture because I think we have in our minds what people want to hear, and it's sometimes a different reality. I mean, sometimes I think about grad school, but I'm happy with um, where I'm volunteering right now, um, and you know, would eventually like to work at the agency that I work that I'm working at. But um, that's 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 probably the most stable part of my life right now is actually um, um, harm reduction services. Do I still dissociate sometimes? Do I still sometimes feel empty? Do these things ever spontaneously happen, or as a result of something that triggers me? Yes, I'm um, I'm not free of suffering. I'm not free of symptoms, but. The, uh, the main difference is these skills and tools that I've learned through DBT allow me to make different choices than I made when I didn't have those resources available to me, so that's why my life looks so different. I do a lot of yoga, mm -hmm. especially restorative, <laughs> Yeah. and um, my writing, I think, has been the probably writing. the ultimate. The blog has evolved into two different books, and... I think more writing them was therapeutic, but I think seeing them sell and hearing feedback from people around the world, like literally around the globe, that they're reading this and feeling less alone and feeling like someone understands their story and that they feel more hopeful, that has been healing for me. I've shared my story and honestly, when I was in the pit of despair and suffering and dysfunction and sabotaging and manipulating and doing all these things because I didn't know any other way, um, I, I didn't really believe in my heart that I could have like a huge transformation. Like I thought I'd always really be suffering to a large degree and, and feel extremely mentally ill and be dependent on the system and constantly being seeking services and being in crisis. Um, so to see huge, huge pieces like the emptiness piece of not being able to tolerate being alone and not being able to imagine handling that without ending up in the emergency room or ending up, you know, threatening to commit suicide or whatever my behaviors were at that time to a point where I actually enjoy having some time alone <laughs> and I feel comfortable in my own skin and I and I feel like I have a sense of who I am and I'm not pretending to be anybody else. Um, so that identity piece too, um, it's just, it's hugely dramatic. <laughs> it's hugely dramatic. I can't, sometimes I can't believe it. And that's why I feel so motivated to put stuff out there to encourage people because I did not believe myself that I could get better, you know? And, but there was a part of me obviously that did and that took the steps to move forward, but to see just how much could change internally, um, I'm just so hopeful for like 
everybody who's out there right now who thinks, you know, am I ever going to get better? Am I ever going to feel this pain? Can I really get over this? Like, yes, you can. You really can. Wow. Look at that. It just talks about me working, doing a needle exchange. Yeah, I work at the counter and do all the needle exchange and work with homeless coming in and uh, sex workers and, you know, we do, we do HIV testing and STD testing and bus passes and outreach. Being well is scary. Because then you're responsible. <laughs> Stop yeah. the stigma of, you know, mental illness. Let's get awareness and let's get people treated. And there is hope for healing.